<laughs> it is an amazing thing to serve a God who has a plan for your lives and who reminds us each week, if we're willing to hear it, that he loves us very much. Amen. And that if we'll stay close to him, he'll help fix the mess we're in. Sometimes we're the mess, right? Amen. That just happens to be the case. So today I want to look with you at a, uh, a word, sanctification, five syllables long. And you know that sometimes you can capture really big ideas in very small syllables. God is love. Amen. Full sentence, three syllables, right? But then you get to sanctification and you're like, what? <laughs> so I want to pause today and I just want to... I want to look briefly at what sanctification is. You'll hear the word thrown around. You'll hear it used. And I want to simplify it, and I want us to to leave here today knowing the beauty of it and what God means when he talks about it in the Bible. Would you pray with me as we begin? Father, as we open your word, would you please help it to be simple? Would you please help us to understand it? Would you please help us to see the beauty of what you plan for us? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I had a favorite grandmother who is now asleep in the Lord, and there were two things in her life where she got to partner to make major decisions that changed her entire paradigm. The first one was when she was younger, she had become deeply addicted to alcohol, and it was was destroying the family life. And grandmother, this is before I was born. This is is the mother that, that my mom and her siblings knew. Grandma drank, and when grandma drank, things didn't, things didn't go well in the house. At some point, grandma figured out, this is a problem. I need to get some help. She joined Alcoholics Anonymous. She went to the 12-step programs, and the grandmother that I knew when I was a little boy was a grandmother that was totally sober, a grandmother full of love and laughter and life who would sit in her little tiny chair and do crossword puzzles that I could not even figure out in all of my wisdom, Right? And drink her little black tea and just love on the family. Amen. That's a victory. Right? That same grandma was was a smoker. My goodness. I I remember staying at the house, right? And it was you walk in the door and, hi, grandma. And it's like a blue fog comes out. Right? I don't know. How many of you had that experience? Right? Now, there was a point in her life long after she had overcome alcohol where, where Doc, the, the doctor that she went to, uh, was doing just routine checks, and he took, he took an x-ray one year, and he sa- found a spot on her lung, a little tiny spot. And he took Myrtle, my grandmother, aside, and he said, Mert, there's this little tiny spot on your lung. It's lung cancer, I'm pretty sure, but it's so small that if you quit smoking now, your lungs can heal. My grandmother, this is according to my mom, my grandmother kind of looked at him and said, Doc, I've been smoking since I was like 14. I'm not going to quit for you or anybody else. Can you guess what my grandmother died from? Lung cancer. Okay. Now, I, I, as a young man, I, I missed her then. I still miss her now as not so young man. And it's a, it's a cautionary tale to me that there are times when, when we get to choose our future? Are we going to partner with our doctor? Sanctification is one of those issues. Sin is consuming our lives in in these love letters, in this rescue story. The the greatest physician of all says, hey, you've got this problem with sin. I'm going to let you choose your future. You can keep sinning, but it's going to separate you from life, or you can partner with me and I'll help you stop. And you'll live forever. And we get to make the choice. So let's explore this a little bit because I would I want us to make the better choice. I want us to choose the life option. I want us to partner with the doctor and say, you know, doc, thanks for catching that. I don't I don't want to die from that. I'll tell you what, I I want to stick around. I want to hear the grandkids and the great grandkids. I want to be there for the weddings and the graduations. So let's explore this. Complete healing, the beauty of biblical sanctification. Now, we talked last week briefly that there's this beautiful promise in Nahum 1.9. Affliction will not rise a second time. In other words, when this book ends and eternity continues, there's no pain, no suffering anywhere in the universe. 
we're face to face with God, we're restored to the tree of life, and we continue to live in a perfected universe for eternity. Amen. And we saw that that could only happen if, as Revelation 21, 27 says, nothing of the contagion of sin makes it into that kingdom, right? We're in quarantine right now, if you've ever thought of it that. This is the last little rebellious place in the universe. This is where sin is holding on and about to end, thank the Lord, right? But we know that that future perfection is possible because Revelation 21, 27 says, nothing impure will ever enter it, not into the new Jerusalem, not into the new earth, and not into the perfected universe, right? All of the sin dies here. That cancer is cured here. So, 1 Thessalonians, we capture a thought. It's a, it's a very old thought. We'll see in just a moment. But this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Well, if you're not quite sure what the definition of the word is, you're not sure if that's like, hey, you're going to the dentist or, hey, we're going to Disneyland. Right? You don't know which way to look at this. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Do I, do I want to be sanctified? So what is sanctification? <coughs> Sanctify is this fancy word. That can mean to set apart or declare or appoint something as holy. That means it's, it's sacred or it's blessed by God. The second definition is to cleanse something from sin. It's become unholy. It's become uh, defiled or broken from the design intent. And to make that thing pure and holy again. So you can think of it in, in a number of ways, but think design intent. Right? Design intent. What was it that the artist painted? That was what, whatever's on the canvas, is. that's what they wanted. Right? Think of it as the, the way the architect designed it or the sculptor sculpted it or the programmer programmed it. When it's complete and the artist says, hey, let's reveal this now, it's that. It's the perfected outcome of intent and intentionality. Think perfect and new and exactly what you're supposed to be. Sanctification is, is boy, it's like Joe Pat and Steve Nesbitt playing in mud puddles as a kid. It, sanctification is when you come home and mom or dad hits you with the garden hose. <laughs> but, you know, in the best sort of way. And they clean you up. And you go from being that muddy little forest creature to something that looks a little bit more like grandma, grandpa, mom, and dad. Sanctification is just cleaning us up and restoring us to the perfection that we found in the first one or two chapters here. It's, what, it's the process of God restoring us to what we should be. Amen. Loving and kind and gracious, patient, the kind of person you want to invite over, the kind of person you don't mind if stays at the house 12, 12 months, 12 years. Hallelujah. Right? Quiz question. Can you think of the first thing that was ever sanctified in Scripture? And it's interesting because it's not really a thing so much as it was the seventh day. Right? Genesis 2, 3, the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, if you remember the old King James, or sanctified it or set it apart. It's the very first thing, this, this little window of time, 24 hours, that when you step into it, you're stepping into something holy every week. And it reminds you, it's supposed to be a reminder that perfection did exist in the past. Perfecting is happening in the present. God's perfecting you and me. And perfection completed, finished. Perfection is coming in the future. So every week we get that little reminder. After Genesis 3, after, after Adam and Eve trade something, and, and there was a trade that happened in Genesis chapter 3, in Genesis 1 and 2, you're given an entire planet and said, this is yours. Take care of it. You could walk right up to a, a lion who was not going to eat you, right? That's in Genesis 1 and 2. All the animals were what? Vegetarian. Surprising, but it's in the Bible, right? You could go the entire planet and there was nothing to cause pain or harm. And there was a trade offered at the tree of life, and the trade kind of sounds like this if you look at Genesis chapter 3. Hey, God has given you the entire planet, and he's brought you an incredible partner, and he's put you in charge of everything here. Will you trade that for me for that piece of fruit? Doesn't sound like a real good trade, right? And, and there's another little thing hiding in there. Is, will, 
I'll tell you what. Um, God has given you the knowledge of good, but I'll tell you what. How about this? If you eat from that tree of life, you'll know good and evil. Yeah, our hearts knowing evil now shrink. We're just like, you, you want to shout back through history, don't do it, right? <laughs> there, because they traded, it was this offer of something they had never seen before, and it turned out to be something that would lead to their tears in the garden over the death of their son and the loved ones that would die ever after. So sanctification after Genesis 3 becomes these four things at least. It, it purifies and alienates us from the power of sin. It, it begins the process of saying, we don't like that. We don't like the process of dying. We don't like pain and suffering. Let, and it begins reorient us, orienting, I can't say this word, reorientating, reorienting, reorienting us toward good and God. It destroys the corrupt inclination of our fallen natures. Inclination. Uh, an incline is what? Isn't an incline a slope? Amen. Right? Amen. It, the way we lean. And, and born as we are, we lean towards sin. That's our inclination. Sanctification destroys that leaning and helps us lean back toward God. Amen. It remedies our sin-leaning desires. Amen. It helps us to understand that not everything I desire is good for me. Right? And it brings our entire being into agreement with the will of God, the designer's intent, so that we may properly be called servants of righteousness, completely aligned with God's creation intent for us. When some of us have had children or grandchildren, isn't it an incredible thought when you know that they're safe, right? They're in the yard, the fence is there, they can't, there's nothing they can get in, and they can't get out and get in harm's way. You know they're safe. God's design intent was that not only this planet, but the entire universe was a safe place for kids. Amen. Not a single tear anywhere. Sanctification returns us to being like dad. It returns us to being an image of God. It's a five-syllable word and just means, hey, it's restoring us, it's cleansing us, it's purifying us. Leviticus 11.44, be holy for I am holy. God saying, I designed you for health and happiness and laughter. Amen. Sin has brought you the opposite of all of those things, but I want to restore that to you, so just copy me, he's saying. Be holy because I'm holy. Well, here's the problem, though. We know this. Romans 3.23 says that all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. We're born inclined to sin, attracted to it. We... We make a mess of our lives. We have regret and shame from decisions that we make. And, and sanctification, this washing up, cleansing up, is so necessary for us to restore us to that holiness that we lost. First Peter, in the New Testament, 1.15 says this, Follow peace with all men and what? And holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Without holiness, without being like Dad, we can't see Him. Do you remember when Moses asked, show me your glory? I'm not sure if that's an ask. That sounds more like a command, right? Show me your glory. He, his, his, in, his desire to see God in physical form. And do you remember what God replied to him at that point? The pre-incarnate Christ replies to him, no man can see me and live. Mm. We're so out of alignment with God now. That if, if he shows up in his glory, in his purity, it's kind of like if I decide to go lay out next to the pool under the sun for 12 hours, but a whole lot worse, right? Just the natural, out of alignment-ness with God consumes us. Nadab and Abihu, do you remember the two sons of Aaron? Yeah. They go into the presence of the Lord without obedience and simply being in the presence of the Lord, they're consumed by fire. But alignment, you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on the other hand. They're thrown into a physical fire. And the Son of God, Christ, shows up and walks around with them. Are they consumed at all? No. No. Their hearts were pure. They were in alignment with God. That's my desire for you and myself, that we would be so aligned with God, so sanctified, so cleaned up, so restored, that we can run up and give Dad, a hug. 
when that time comes. Right? Jesus simplifies this idea for us. However you want people to treat you, so treat them. That's the golden rule, right? If, if this gets really complicated for us, Jesus wanted it to be really simple. He said, however you want to be treated, you treat people that way. Amen. Wouldn't that be a simple, simple solution to a lot of the world's problems right now? Don't want you to, I don't want my country stolen, I'm not going to steal your country. I don't want a war to start in my country, so I'm not going to start one in yours. I don't want someone to steal my stuff, so I'm not going to steal yours. All of a sudden, this world would be a very nice place to live. Amen. Look at that. He mowed my lawn. I think that's my neighbor. What's he doing? Right? However you want people to treat you, so treat them. This is the law and the prophets. Matthew 25, 40. To the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to who? That, this is interesting because... Jesus ties his identity to humanity. However you're treating other people, he's like, you're treating me that way. Okay, let's take that seriously. Because in this world at this time, we have the ability to say all sorts of things and post it online, right? We can tweet. I don't know if they call it X now, but we tweet on what used to be Twitter. You can throw out Instagram Videos, you can throw out anything you want to about anybody you want to. But if Christ asks us to treat people like we want to be treated, what would our tweets and emails and videos and shorts, what would they all sound and look like? They would sound like love. Amen. They would sound like love. Amen. Whether someone was in a different political party than us, whether somebody was in a different ideology than us, whether they were in a different religion with us, everything we produced would sound like love. Hmm, that's a high call. Do you remember there was this, this question that God asked at one time? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Where was Jesus from? Nazareth. Yeah, he was from Nazareth. And the disciples, when they hear that, hey, we found the Messiah, and he's from Nazareth, they're like, no. No. <laughs> The Messiah is not from Nazareth. In fact, nothing good is from Nazareth. But history showed what? Did something good come from Nazareth? Amen. Amen. Something very good came from Nazareth. So sometimes nowadays we're tempted to say, can anything good from, come from that political party? Whichever one it is, right, of all our choices. Can anything good come from that religion? We're tempted to say. But Scripture you know, Scripture reminds us there's a, there's a solid answer here because if we're considering Christ, that, that answer to anything, whoever we dislike or disagree with, a group, an organization, can anything good come from them? Well, Revelation 18 indicates that there's a time the world is being invited to Christ from those places, right? I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, who? My people. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins or contract any of her plagues. Do people come out of those organizations, the ones we don't care for, the ones that we have a problem with now, whatever one it is? Do they come out of that? Yes. They do. John sees a multitude around the throne so large it can't be counted, and they came from somewhere. And they didn't all look like us or sound like us. They didn't sit next to us in a pew. They didn't vote the same way we voted. They came from somewhere else. Good things can come from very, very, very corrupt places. Christ came from a very corrupt place. And I praise the Lord. He tries to teach us to reset our expectations and tweet and email and post only love so that someday someone can find their way out of an organization to Christ. Amen. 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 The really good news. The really good news is that the maker of all the good stuff is the one that helps us become the good stuff. Amen. Wow. Exodus 31, 13, the last part of the verse. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. That should make us just rejoice. Wow. Amen. I am the Lord that sanctifies you. I'm the one that speaks galaxies into existence. I think I got you covered, right? I'm the one who creates beauty and art, he says. I can, I create complicated stuff. He says, I got you covered. Amen. I'm sanctifying you, God says. Amen. 
And if the one who creates all the wondrous design that we see says, I'm recreating you, you're in really good hands. Amen. It's going to be beautiful. He says it again much later in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 20, 12, the exact same thing. I'm the Lord who sanctifies you. It's almost like he's trying to get through to a bunch of kids who can't quite remember something. All right, <laughs> let me repeat this. I'm going to say it again a few hundred years later. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Amen. If I've started something in you, some good work, I will finish it. And you will be amazing when you're done. Amen. Right? Amen. Hebrews 2.11, for both he who sanctifies, that's Christ, and those who are sanctified, that's us, are all from one Father, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Amen. The one who is creating you beautiful and recreating me beautiful loves the fact that we're related to him. And that's really amazing, isn't it? Amen. Can you imagine God pointing at you from like, yeah, you know, from some planet? He's like, look, that's my kid. Right? And his chest is way out here, and he's like, that's my kid. Because that's God's picture of you. He sees us for what we can be. He knows who we are, and he loves us anyway. And then he's trying to clean us up. He gives us a gift, and we already touched on this, to help us remember that it is happening, and it is possible, and it will be completed. And every single week, this reminder rolls around, I've got you covered. Hallelujah. I'm finishing the work in you. Hallelujah. If you're not there yet, keep hoping. Hallelujah. If you're not there yet, keep believing. I got you covered. Because every seventh day, it's like this little holiness window opens up and comes around. Hallelujah. And you enter it, and you're reminded for that 24-hour period I'm the God that created the universe, and I'm recreating you. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? Every covenantal Seventh-day Sabbath. That's why it's part of the moral law. The covenant. Even when the covenant, you know, if you get into Isaiah, I think it's around Isaiah 56, and, and God is talking about the non-Jewish world in the future. And he says something like this. He says, uh, he speaks to two groups. He speaks to eunuchs who can't have children, and, and he speaks to the foreigner who wasn't allowed anywhere in his presence, so they thought. He says, if you keep my Sabbaths and my covenant, right? He's gonna, and the promise is he's going to draw them all near, that his house is a house of prayer for all people. Amen. Amen. But it was about keeping the seventh day Sabbath because it's part of the moral law and knowing every week as that comes around, it's the creator God that's doing this. It's the creator God that made everything who is remaking me. It's the one who went to Calvary for me, who spoke the universe into existence that's speaking new life into me. Hmm. All right, so let's go back because we only gave you part of those two verses. Here's the rest of them. Exodus 31, 13. You shall surely observe my Sabbath. Now in scripture, if you ever want something interesting, go look. There's a difference between my Sabbath as God says, and your Sabbaths. My Sabbath throughout the Old Testament is always the seventh-day Sabbath. Your Sabbaths are all, the, are all of the Sabbaths that God had asked them to celebrate as pointing forward, the shadows that were pointing forward to the types. My Sabbaths are the one he wrote in with his finger in stone and put inside the ark. Your Sabbaths were the ones that Moses wrote with his handwriting and put on the outside of the ark. My Sabbaths are the ones that he asked us to still keep, your Sabbaths are the ones that, when, when Christ came and was our sacrifice and type met anti-type, those Sabbaths could go away, just like the temple was allowed to go away. So here it is. Observe my Sabbath. That's the seventh-day Sabbath of the moral law. This is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Right? Yeah, and our little heads should go poof. Right? <laughs> the creator of all things loves and wants me, and he's making... He's making me just like he made the world. Wow. What am I going to look like when I'm done? You guys, okay, let's go on a rabbit trail. We'll follow a rabbit. The monarch butterfly. Have you ever, have you ever noticed it starts as a little egg and then it turns into this little grub that eats a lot of leaves and then it cocoons for a little bit and it comes out and it's this mind-blowingly beautiful butterfly that has a life cycle that takes it often from the northern hemisphere to Mexico and back in four generations or so. Have you guys ever thought that we're like the little grub part of this journey right now? Ah, not too complimentary, right? But that in the life cycle of this whole thing, if the Old Testament is true and we will rise up on wings like eagles, maybe we're a little closer to that imagery of the butterfly than we thought. 
that the best part of our journey is that transformation that happens when Jesus returns and we rise up to meet him in the air forever to be with him. We go off to wherever he is from and then we come back a thousand years later. You see a little migration happen? Wow. Right? We leave the world, we come back. The monarch butterfly leaves and comes back. Just rabbit trails. I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. He says it again. I gave them my Sabbaths, and that is from Genesis. That is from the first two chapters where he sees everything, and he says it's very good, and he blesses that Sabbath day, and he sanctifies the day. Hmm. All right. Let's keep going if this clicker still works. It doesn't work. <laughs> Give me a second here. Technology is always wonderful. Ooh, I have other options here. But, all right. We'll see. Al, is it, is it this that's dysfunctional? All right, we'll keep going here. A part to play and an effort to make. God's not going to do this on his own. He's a gentleman, and we'll see that in a second. He wants us to take part in this. Just like my grandmother was invited by the physician, hey, Myrtle, there's a spot on your lung. You have a part to play. Would you like to avoid cancer? Right? God wants us to see what the problem is, and he wants us to participate in the cure. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Okay? That's John 3.3. 3. There's, there's this work that we can do. Um, Al, I'm going to do the old-fashioned next slide, please, kind of thought here. All right, let's see. Nope. And that's okay. All right, so I'll do the next, next slide, even though it'll only advance like one text at a time here. No worries, because I can finish this without it, because I have a phone with all the slides on it. But we could also finish it without the slides. Let's go here to, ah, we'll see. It's always a wrestling match. All right. Okay, so the reset worked there. Thank you, Al. Um, abstain from all appearance of evil. The very God of peace sanctifies you wholly. What are we supposed to do? Not just abstain from evil, but abstain. Don't do anything that even looks the opposite of love. There's a part for us to play. Like, hey, I, if that looks like it's bad or if that sounds bad, I'm not supposed to do it. All right? John 17 says that truth affects this change in us. What's the change agent? What is it? It's like, what's the soap? What, what is it that cleanses me here? Sanctify them through your truth. Clean them, restore them, re, remake them through your truth. Then he says this, your word is truth. Amen. It's not like you take the Bible and you're like, I'm good, right? Soap, it's not, no. Where does this go? Where do these words go? They go into our mind. They reshape the way we think. If we allow them to do that, then it reshapes what we say and do. Amen. And, Amen. and think, right? Yes. If we allow it, that's the key. Now you are clean through the word that I have spoken to you. Again, he's saying it's the word that I'm speaking. If you want to be re made in my image, it's the word of God that's going to accomplish this. Now, we think of this as the word of God here, rightly so, right? 66 words. But it's also the power of God speaking. Remember days one through six? God said, let there be light, right? And there was light. And God said, and it's like 10 times that God said, right? He speaks. So it's incredible to think that the same person, the same being that is spoke perfection can speak into your life and mine and there was that's interesting seeing you have purified your hearts and obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brother and see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently you've purified your hearts how in obeying the truth this is, the, this is the part of the story where my grandmother had that moment where the doctor had said, it's, there's this spot there, but you can heal if you partner, if you work with me. This is God saying, here's truth. It will clean and restore you if what? 
if you obey it, if you act on it. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 highlights this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And here's the fun, interesting, amazing part. So that, or that, the end result, the man or woman of God, the person, the human of God, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Perfect. That's Genesis 1 and 2 perfect, right? The word of God, this, when accepted and acted on, restores us to the, to the way we were intended to be, rolling off of that fresh production line in Genesis 1 and 2. It's like, wow, look at that. They're humans. They're amazing. At that moment, we were safe to take off world and go to the rest of the universe. Not so much now, right? We need to be sanctified. This is called an uptrend. If you invest, this is a very good thing, right? You want all the ups and none of the downs. This is the trend of your life when you begin to partner with God. You begin to look more like Dad. You may occasionally drop back into some sin, but then with Christ, you get back up and you keep going toward the likeness of Dad again. And your life becomes a, a general uptrend toward God. Now, some of us really beat ourselves up sometimes on those downward ticks when we fall into something. We make a bad decision. We make a, a sinful choice. And we say, am I, am I not doing this right? And I would remind you again from Isaiah, cease doing evil. Learn to do good. Amen. Get back on that bicycle. Gravity is a tough thing. Right? But you will get your balance. You will learn to love good, to hate evil. And each time you can learn, 1 Corinthians promises that with every temptation there's a way of escape. Right? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's always a way of escape. We just have to slow down enough to say, Dad, in this moment, you choose forward. The trend will be upward toward God. Three reminders here. It's not by your strength but by God's help, right? Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, Hallelujah. right? Says the Lord Almighty, Is that Zechariah 4, 6. It's God working in us if we'll partner with him, if we'll partner with him. So not by our own strength, but by God's help. Second, well, we're going to interject here, because God is polite. Do you remember the account in John 5, 6? There's a gentleman there that for decades has been crippled. Decades he's been crippled. Jesus, as the owner and creator of the universe, could just step up and start ordering things to happen, couldn't he? But what did he do that day? Do you want to be made whole? That's an invitation to recreation. Do you want to be made whole? He's not about to bust down the doors and, and make you into something that you don't want to be. Do you want to be recreated in the image of God? God is such a gentleman. He asks. In, in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens, I will come in and eat with him, right? What is God not doing in Revelation? He's not knocking down the doors. He waits for us to invite him to lead us to the next truth. He waits for us to invite him, please, I want to partner with you. Please restore me. Hallelujah. I don't want that little spot on the x-ray to become something bigger. I don't want sin to separate me from life. I want to see more sunrises and sunsets. I want to see an eternity worth. So he asks. Second reminder, it's not always instantly, but it's over time. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Like a that's, that's a huge promise. And it is a promise that says, if you're not there yet, don't worry, he's still at work. Because Christ, Christ has not returned yet. Whatever it is you're fighting, whatever you and the Holy Spirit are working on, whatever habits you're unlearning, whatever new ways of being that you are in the process of becoming, I'm not going to say that, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to go there. Whatever those things are the Holy Spirit's working on you, please be patient with yourself. Hallelujah. Right? He'll get you there. That's the promise. Amen. Until the day of Christ Jesus. And not only him and not only me, but it's a partnership, right? It's us working with him. 
take my yoke upon you, learn from me. Cease doing evil, learn to do good. You see this theme in Scripture? He knows sin creates some really big pathways in our mind. He knows that endorphins are pretty addictive. And so he partners with us to unlearn things. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. If, if you think about what a yoke is, we don't see them too often here because most of our yokes say John Deere on them, right? And they're high-powered and running on diesel. But the yoke is when you have this wooden object that connects one ox or donkey or animal to another right next to it. Now, if Christ is asking us to take my yoke upon you, where is he? He's next to us. He's the one that is partnering with us. We are in the yoke with him. He's leading us where he knows it's safest and best and healthiest. So it's not him, it's not, it's not just him, and it's not just us, but it's togetherness. All right, so I don't know what imagery you need to help understand the process of sanctification and cleansing and getting you there, but let's pick a local one. We know palm trees when we see them, right? This is Florida. Seed to sprout, sprout to tree, tree to fruit bearing. It's a process that takes time, all right? Well, maybe you're from the Midwest or somewhere. Seed to sprout, sprout to stock. Stock to fruit bearing. It's still a process, right? These biological processes of growth so that when we're nine heading toward 90-something, God's there every breath with us, helping us. And if you grew up where I grew up, it's these things, big evergreen trees. Seed to sprout, sprout to tree, tree to cones 200 feet up in the air, right? A process. Every breath of your life, God is with you, helping you to be the better you. So be patient with one another, right? How often do we want to mic? Well, I won't say it that way. How often do we want the people that are around us to be better people? <laughs> And we want it now. We want that. Oh, man, microwaves have ruined our life for everything. <laughs> one minute. Actually, one second, right? And you're like, go, ding, done. <laughs> the walk of sanctification, the process of cleansing and restoring us is so often not that quick. Now, sometimes it is, right? But most often it's not. So please be patient with one another. God's not done with you, and he's not done with your spouse. He's not done with the people sitting next to us in the pews, and he's not done with the pastor, right? Love one another. All our tweets, everything we do, everything we say, the idea is God make me like you so that everything I think and do comes across as loving. Amen. We'll get there. Christ will get us there. Next steps for us. First of all, could we... Take the next step this year and read the Bible to learn God's design intent. What is supposed to be happening in my life? What is his goal for our sanctification? What's his purpose? Because in this book, it's about restoring the ability in us to know good, to appreciate good, and to love as God loves. But I don't know it if I don't read it. And I don't know it's possible if I don't encounter the impossible in this book. Hallelujah. A life restored. Maybe our next step is to begin the journey by choosing his will and desire to restore you. My grandmother had a moment where she could have looked at Doc and said, Doc, let's do it. What's a good non-smoking, stop smoking program? How do I do this? I've been doing this since I was a kid. It's a pretty big habit, right? What are we going to say to God? Because he's going to wait on us. And he's not, he's going to be a gentleman. He's going to let us invite him into the change process. Hmm. Maybe our next step could be the moment-by-moment -moment submission of my will, my thoughts, and my words, and my next actions to God. Hallelujah. We type fast. We text fast. And sometimes the emotions get big, and we're just, the thumbs are going. 400 words a minute, right? Maybe this year we could slow down a little. Maybe this year, this could be the year we say, Lord, from this Sabbath forward, please don't let me text, 
tweet, email, shoot video, and post it until I brought it to you for review. Maybe this year my internet presence could be one that if somebody stumbles across me and they don't, they're not in my religion, and they're not in my political party, and they don't agree with my ideas, they would still want to call me up and say, you know about God and you're so nice. Could you tell me about him? Maybe this year the things we say and do could start to sound a lot like love. Glory to God. On step four then. Next step for some of us is to take down, delete, re-edit, reshoot, and repost. Man, when we send stuff up into the cloud, it's there. We can go look at things from decades ago. Friends, if you know that there are things that you have posted, your job and my job is the same. As a child of God seeking to love like he loves, we need to go back and delete the stuff we put out there. If we need to apologize, let's apologize. If we need to make up, let's make up. Don't leave stuff that you've put out on the internet that makes fun of other people, that calls them losers if they don't agree with your ideology, that makes fun of the way they dress or look because that's the way they dress or look. And I'm saying this because I've been on the internet and your pastor's always interested in what you post. So I'm not talking general. I'm I'm talking these are specifics. So friends, if you've got stuff out there and it doesn't sound like Jesus, take it down. Partner with the Holy Spirit because heaven will be full of former enemies that became family gathered from every kindred, nation, tongue, and people and from every Nazareth there ever was. Can anything good come from that political party? Yes, through Christ. Can anything good come from that religion? Yes, because of Jesus. And once we start seeing the possibility of sanctification and restoration through Christ, we can start loving like he loves. And then, last of all, perhaps the next step is to share the good news of a God who partners with us to restore us to perfection and who is returning soon. Friends, I don't think there's a separate section of heaven that says Adventist only over here. Like a 55 and older community, it's like Adventist... No, there isn't, because we're all children of God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, right? So maybe this year, we could share the good news of a God who restores all of us to Genesis 1 and 2 perfection, and love as God loves. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are amazed that you want to clean us up, but I guess that's what dads do. That's what moms do. That's what loving parents do. Father, please help us to take this to heart, to be patient with the people in the pews next to us, to be patient with ourselves, to believe that the process is happening and will be completed. Lord, help us to love this year as you love us, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.